How much responsibility should front-end developers take for making their web apps accessible? Uh, all of the responsibility, really. Um, having a web app or a website or a web whatever be accessible is one of the, I mean, it's the primary thing that any thing on the web should do. The web was designed to be universally accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, um, the first sentence on the first web page ever created has the words universal access in it. Basically, you know, universal access to a universe of documents. And we can quibble about the meaning of document and whether, whether that, that, you know, maybe we could, we could generalize that to information, right, a universe of information. Although, you know, the document paradigm still persists. We, and so many people try to overcome it. And yet, it's still there because that's how this medium was was built. Those are fundamental design principles in the medium: is you know universal access to a universe of documents. And so, when we make things inaccessible, that like the web by its nature is, is 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 accessible, and we go to all this effort to do things that end up making it not accessible. And um, it's sort of it's it's in parallel to how uh, if you look at that first web page which has no CSS on it, because there was no such sure. thing at the time, <laughs> right, right. right? It's just straight HTML, and you, you know, pull it up on any number of devices, it's completely responsive. Mm -hmm. The web by its nature is totally responsive, um, but we had to go through this whole period of making it not responsive, and then come up with ways to make it responsive again, and, and you know, coin a term, responsive web design, <laughs> to, right? Because we'd spent so long making it not responsive. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of the same thing with, you know, accessibility, and, and at this point, accessibility to a large degree, I mean, it's, it's certainly about people who, um, have accessibility needs in the sort of what we think of as the traditional sense. You know, people who can't see, people who um, have motor control, but it's also people who don't have JavaScript or mm -hmm. people who don't have a lot of bandwidth, right? That's a form of access. And in fact, bandwidth is in some ways the fundamental form of access. Like the more bandwidth you have, the faster things can happen. But the less bandwidth you have, the slower things happen. And the less processor you have, the slower things happen. So if somebody has um, an iPhone 4, mm -hmm on a GPRS network, nothing, like, you know, so many things won't load. Not because of the bandwidth, because of the way that things, are, well, because of the bandwidth, but because of the way things are constructed, if we have these sites that are this enormous ball of JavaScript, basically, mm -hmm. and it's, and, and the idea is to, like, push everything onto the, onto the client, onto the phone or the, the, the browser, and have it do everything locally, so as, so that you don't have to wait for the network when you're updating things. That's great if you can push that entire ball to a device that has the processor to deal with it, like boom, which is absolutely possible when you're sitting in your developer in your development office sure. at your agency and you have gigabit Wi-Fi right. saturating the entire air, and you know it's like wow, this thing loaded in less than a second, and then mm -hmm. everything's super snappy after that because we never have to talk to the network again. You know, well, where I go on vacation, there's very little cell signal. Mm -hmm. And so for a site like that, if I'm waiting for, you know, several hundred K of JavaScript or, you know, a couple of megabytes, uh, the site's not going to do anything for minutes on end. And that's assuming that I even get to like, even that I get everything to make it work. Right. So um, that's what my talk was about this morning was basically saying, Look, we go to so much effort to break the web, right? right. In, in the in the name of let's make this cooler and faster, and um, you know, cooler and faster are great, but not at the expense of accessibility. And, and as I say, accessibility not just for you know people who have limitations in their perceptual space, mm -hmm. but people who have limitations in the amount of data that they can they can receive, and you know how fast they can receive it, and what kind of device they have, because not everyone has an iPhone 6 Plus right. with 64 gigs of memory. So, I, in fact, I don't. I still have my iPhone 4 because yeah. it works fine, but uh, it executes JavaScript very slowly. So, I, my next question was, I was going to ask you how edge cases should mm -hmm. be handled, but it sounds more like, how should reasonable accessibility be handled? Well, and so, the interesting thing about the term edge case, uh, as as um, as I, someone pointed out to me in conversation recently online, I'm, uh, when you say edge case, what you're saying is these are the limits of what I care about, mm -hmm. right? That's what an edge case mm -hmm. is typically. It's the that's on the edge. We don't. We're not going to worry about that. Um, but th you know, those are there are the edge cases are not just cases. They're people, right? And so. Um, 
one of the things, one of the terms that I use now is a stress case, which I got from Jared Spool, rather than an edge case, um, where you have a situation where the network is much more stressed than you than you anticipated when when a when a when a person comes in or um, their the device that they're using to try to load and, and render your site is its processor is much more stressed because it's much less capable than yours, and so you know edge cases are. Again, it's like I, I, I much prefer the term stress case, mm -hmm. um, and so thank you to Jared for that. Um, because yeah, just because it, we say edge case, and edge case, to my mind, often is develop is designer or developer speak for a completely valid use case that I just don't want to think about. Yeah. Right, I don't want to bother with that. Um, it's much easier to assume that everyone will have, the you know, a, a really fast uh, data connection with a really fast device, and and you know, a big display, and you know, not think about what will happen if they try to load it up on a feature phone. What does it look like in practice to be able to address the accessibility? Is it degrading gracefully? That kind well, of it's enhancing progressively, okay. um, as opposed to <laughs> degrading gracefully. So, uh, you know, when we talk about degrading gracefully, what we're saying is, okay, we're gonna we're gonna build this like incredibly top flight thing, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna figure out how to fall back from that. Mm -hmm. And progressively enhancing is let's create like this basic core, mm -hmm. and then add things on from there. So that like this is sort of our this is our minimum. I don't want to. I don't want to use the term minimum viable product because that has a whole like thing that goes with it. But it's it's the the minimum thing that that we deliver. You know, if somebody hits this site with NCSA Mosaic, right, what mm -hmm. will happen? Right. And if somebody hits this site with Internet Explorer six, right, because they're coming from a public library that doesn't have the funding to update its computers and, and they've got the install completely locked down so that they're not hit with malware and so they're not willing to upgrade IE, you know, past IE6 or IE7 or whatever it is. Um, you know, those those could be people, you know, someone who, who's coming to a public library to use the public terminal. You know, they're not coming to your site on a lark. Right. right? They're there for a reason. And if you can create something so that they can get information, it may not look as cool as what what the the full experience is, and it may not have all of the bells and whistles, and it may actually end up being more load on on your server because um, you know you your core experience involves you know using HTML forms, mm -hmm. right? And then if there's no JavaScript or if the JavaScript you know, fails to load for some reason, then you have the server round trips, and okay, that's more stress on your server, but then you can enhance that so that instead of doing entire server round trips, you're like using XHTML HTTP request to like send a little bit of data and get a little bit of data back and like things mm -hmm. like that. So that's you know, that's that's one way that it can look. And you know, obviously there are going to be some situations if you're writing a tower defense game in WebGL, if the computer doesn't like the browser doesn't support WebGL, right. then right. but but what what I would say there is then you say you don't just give them a blank page. And or even worse, you don't make them sit there waiting on a, for two minutes on a download and then give them a blank page, <laughs> right? You, right? You 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 have mean. Yeah. right. You have something that says, "Hey, this we developed this with WebGL, or we developed this using the Unity plugin, or we developed right. this using so and so, at which your your device can't do." Right? Let them know what went wrong, yeah. because a lot in a lot of cases, you know, we see something and there's a little spinner, and we think. Okay, is, is there more data coming? Is it just an animated GIF that they never updated? <laughs> is it is it that my computer's never going to run this? Right. Right. There needs to, there there should be those sorts of things to just let them know. Look, this just isn't going to work for you. So, what is your take on the overall state of web standards and principles? Is it in good shape? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm very CSS centric because of my my sort of professional history. But CSS, for example, is advancing at a rate that I haven't ever seen, right? All kinds of stuff being added, um, widespread support being built out um, from brow in browsers. Um, you know, still little problems here and there, but that, that happens. Just because of the nature, again, the nature of the web, it's, uh, it's not like developing for OS 10. Mm. 
right, where you have this like very defined situation, you have this very defined environment, and then you just develop for that. Uh, it's not even like developing for iOS, or, or it's, it's probably a little more like developing for Android, but not really. The, you know, Android, obviously there's, a, there's more fragmentation in terms of operating system and way more fragmentation in terms of display space. The web is even more fragmented than that. Again, by design. I mean, sure. it was designed to be cross-platform so that any, any system that could run a web browser could run a web browser, basically. And so, um, so we're always going to have these inconsistencies. Like, the only time that there was no inconsistency on the web is when there was one web browser. Right. Like the minute somebody <laughs> shipped a second web browser, that error was over. That was it. <laughs> Done. Right? So um, we're, uh, but we're, I mean, there's a ton of stuff happening. Um, flexible box layout has just come up. Grid layout is being worked on actively. There's um, interesting stuff in the, in some of the editor's drafts, so um, that's coming from preprocessors. So, the CSS4 color module, uh, level four color module, has things like um, being able to hue shift colors, just to be able to say, whatever the color of this thing is, I want you to like move it around the hue wheel, or whatever it is, I want you to make it 30% lighter or 40% mm -hmm. darker, which is absolutely from less than SAS preprocess. You know, like those are those are already features in those in those preprocessors and. The working group is looking at the, what the preprocessors are doing and what's popular in the preprocessors and saying, okay, well, let's make that native. And that's one example of that um, sort of that IETF model. Like the W3C was, has historically been, let's figure out what people want to do and then f define how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're pretty good track record at guessing, but not always 100% great. Um, whereas the IETF generally is, Everyone's just like the, the 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 market will figure it out, mm -hmm. and then we'll just write down what the market came to. Yeah. So this is a little bit more of that model at the W3C, which I actually I like because sure sometimes it totally makes sense to like figure out that a highway should be here, and so let's define how the highway gets built. But other times it really makes sense to pave the cow paths. Mm -hmm. Right? This is where people are already going. Let's just let's make that better. So there's a there's a lot of stuff happening there, and, and even outside of CSS, you know. Um, there's all kinds of stuff with JavaScript happening. You know, it's, I'm not completely, I'm not like, you know, totally against JavaScript. It's, JavaScript is great. You can do a lot of really great stuff with it. But um, as so, and they have all kinds of new features coming. Um, and they're on, a, they're on a pretty good release cycle. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, it reminds me of the 90s when browsers were constantly updating right. and expanding out. And yet it's nothing like the 90s because that's when browsers were completely, constantly updating and branching out in completely separate directions, mm -hmm. sometimes intentionally so, right? To be almost, they were, they were almost choosing to be incompatible. Now it's, there's all this, all this expansion, but it's, it's happening with, uh, you know, everyone's looking towards everyone else to make sure that, hey, we're doing this in an interoperable way, right. which is fantastic. How do you stay up to date on web standards? Uh, uh, Twitter, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, RSS, baby. Yeah. I have an RSS reader, and yeah. I, uh, to, to, honestly, to a large extent, uh, just following the W3C RSS feeds. Is that right? They're, they're really very good about saying, you know, this this draft has just uh, entered. A, you know, there, there's a new working draft of this this standard or that specification or this module or whatever. Um, you know, there's a it's it's in last call. You know, it's moved to proposed candidate, et cetera, et cetera. They're very good about it these days. Um, so there's that, and um, I mean Twitter. I, I say that somewhat facetiously, but at the same time, you know, somebody does something that's really awesome. It ends up all over Twitter, sure. right? Yep. And so, and you, maybe you'll see two or three people link to the same thing, or you'll see something get retweeted a few times, and you say, "Think to, I'll think to myself, okay, hmm, let's, let's go look at that." Right. Um, beyond that, I think it's really, um, and you know, reading sites like a list apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, since uh, I co-founded an event apart um, with with Jeffrey Zeldman, um, I go to basically all of those shows, back to going to all those shows, and uh, just hearing what the speakers have to say there, I actually learn a ton just sitting there. And coming here, for that matter, you know, coming to yeah. Fluent or, or, or any other conference, just hearing what people are talking about and you know, the hallway conversation, you know, this is 
what you know someone will be talking about well we had this problem this is how we solved it and you think to yourself wow that's interesting i, had, I haven't even heard of that what is that and they tell describe what it is and you know someone else comes and says oh we we tried using that and here's it failed in these ways for these reasons for us and mm -hmm. that's yeah that's it's it's basically just trying to hear the community what is the biggest web issue that you're running into right now so for me this is a little bit personal but that that's how these things happen. For me, the biggest web issue I'm running into is actually a design problem. Mm -hmm. um, what I've realized over the last couple of years um, is that design, it, like designers, and not just web designers, but this totally happens on the web. Um, web designers are really, really great at creating the, like, the, the best experience for the use case they have in mind. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and, this is, and as I say, this is true everywhere. But web design is what I know, so this is where I'm going to try to start dealing with it. Um, so, um, you know, the, the design team might have a, a few per, little list of personas, right, with the like happy cherry mm -hmm. stock photo, yep. Yep. and the you know how do we how do we get them to do the the thing that we're offering in the best possible way, right? Design and and you know with that with that vision in mind, designers are fantastic at figuring out how to do that. But what they don't think about is what happens if um, if the if the person who's coming in is like completely stressed out and you know like this is just one of a hundred things that they've got to do and it's and they don't have the cognitive load bandwidth to, to figure it out. They're they're already stressed out. Or you know what happens if they're on a, in a low bandwidth situation where they're not getting like our JavaScript? What happens if they're um, what happens if part of, of the technology fails? You know, how do we deal with that? Like, this is not even thought about. Mm -hmm. And um, so, one of the um, examples of this that, that um, I've, I've actually been talking about this year um, at, at various conferences is um, if you go to a hospital website, and uh, just about any hospital website. Um, in fact, I don't know of one where this isn't true. You go to a hospital website and look at it as though you are somebody who is in the passenger seat of a car, being driven to the hospital at high rates of speed because a loved one has been taken to the hospital, and you need to know like what to do when you get there. Yeah. It's not how to get there, right? The right. GPS in the car, the GPS on your phone is, will tell you where to turn and how to get to the mailing address of the hospital, and yet the mailing address of the hospital is never where the emergency room door is. Right. And and in some cases, you, you know, maybe you're not even supposed to go to the emergency room door. If you have someone who's, if you have a, a, a loved one who's being life flighted to the hospital, they're not coming in through those doors. They're coming in somewhere else. So what, what do you do? And you would think, hospitals being hospitals, where this thing happens every day, mm -hmm that there would be on the home page or in the navigation right. or the footer, you know, are you coming here unexpectedly? Here's what you need to know. None of them do it because we the humans generally are not great about envisioning the negative contingencies unless that's like your job to do that. Mm -hmm. And also uh, designers aren't taught to do it. And again, not just web design and not just, not just hospital websites. I mean, it happens everywhere. And, and once I realized that, I started to see it more and more and more. And to me, this is one of the, one of the big problems, especially with social networking um, because most of the design problems that we've dealt with have been at things that are a distance from us. Mm -hmm. So buying Legos on Amazon or um, you know, searching for a car, the, you know, doing research to, to find a car, looking up stuff on Wikipedia. That's all things that are distant from us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these, these are things that are very close to us personally, right? And the closer basically the closer things are to, to us as people, the harder the design challenges are. It's almost, a, it's almost an asymptotic relationship. Right? The closer it gets to you, the, the, like, the greater the chance of something going horribly wrong. And just in, with you assuming, hey, this is how, this is our ideal you know, situation, this is our ideal outcome for a user. But, you know, but when someone, someone comes in and isn't coming from that angle, mm -hmm. and they're not just unable to do what you wanted them to do, but actually actively frustrated and further upset, right, that's, you're actually, I mean, ethically, that's a problem. I mean, just as a, from a human point of view, but also in a, you know, in a business sense, if you're 
you know, frustrating and enraging your, sure. your, your right. visitors, they're not going to come back, right. Right? or they'll be less likely to come back. Um, and so there's both an ethical and a business case to do this properly. And, and my contention is that if you, if you keep these stress cases, to use that term again, in mind, when you design, if you can create design solutions that will help people in those situations, then you're creating design solutions that will help everybody. Sure. Because someone who's not stressed out, someone who does have all that mental bandwidth, is going to be able to, to do whatever it is that you've designed. Is it about empathy? It's, it's somewhat about empathy, but it's, it's more than empathy. I, empathy is definitely required. And yeah, um, but you, there's, What's missing almost is an awareness that the empathy needs to be used. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's 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 sort of the it's it's not that people lack empathy. It's that they're not aware that that this is a way in which empathy should be used in design. Mm -hmm. um, and in fairness, it's not always um, it's not always a stress case. You may be designing something um, for that specifically for stress cases. But in, in that case, it, it would then behoove you to say, okay, well, what if someone stumbles on this page and they're not completely stressed out, right? Um, is it still going to be, is it still going to work for them? Or are they actually going to be misled by the assumptions that we've made here? So there's, you know, there, the, the sort of thinking about the actual design assumptions and challenging them is not something that, that um, I think is taught. And it's not something that comes naturally to, to people in general. And so that's, to me, that's one of the biggest problems. And, it, and, it, and it's becoming a problem because the things that we're doing are getting so close to us personally, right? They're getting close to us emotionally. Um, you know, when someone posts on Facebook, it's not always the awesome stuff in their lives. Right. Like people will post about you know, losing jobs or you know, having you know, breaking up with a, with a, with a loved one or um, you know, just the, like the entirety of, of, of their lives are, are going onto these, onto these networks now because they're sharing with their community. So it totally makes sense um, that they would do that, but the design isn't keeping up with that. Mm. Um, and you know, experience design, visual design, you know, a lot of ways is it, that this can go. But that's that to me is one of the biggest challenges, and it's going to be a very difficult challenge because, like I say, you know, figuring out how to sell widgets online took some time. There were some missteps. But we figured it out, mm -hmm. and it wasn't comparatively speaking, it wasn't that difficult. Um, but when you compare that to the challenges of how do you get design, how do you get algorithms to act in a humane manner, in a, in a re respectful, attackful manner. Those are really hard problems. I mean, yeah. some humans have trouble with that. Right. Right. <laughs> Never mind writing code to try to model that sort of behavior. So it'll be interesting. What was the biggest issue that you had five years ago? God, five years ago. I think five years ago was probably, um, geez, people are using the web on phones now, how do we deal with that, right? <laughs> right. So it was sort of that sure. just before responsive web design yep. um, sort of became a thing. It was the, you know, like the iPhone had come out and said, now you can have the whole web on your phone, right? You can pinch and mm -hmm. zoom and it, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real web page. Um, and that was great for the first couple of years, and then we started to realize, you know what, this kind of this stinks, <laughs> right? I, I get this tiny little That's postage right. stamp, and I'm like, Love is it. this the right part? And yeah. I <laughs> pan over here, and then I try to pan, and I accidentally, you know, tap the link instead of yep. panning, and then I have to back up and right. So that was that, that was sort of the the the. the the field was grappling with that, and and there were a lot of people who were you know starting to say things like, "Hey, you know, we have media queries, and you can change layouts and stuff like that." But no one had really synthesized it um, into what became responsive web design until Ethan Marcotte did, mm -hmm. basically, where he said, "Look, this is how this is what we can do, and here's a here's a way to do it, and here you know you can." Rearrange things and move things around, and mm -hmm. and and make it uh, much better across various devices. But that was really, to me, that was that was the biggest challenge five years ago. Last question for you: okay. What uh, people or projects are you following? These days? So um, I well, I follow the people that I meet at conferences, either this you know mine or this one or, or anywhere else I go to. Um, the the project that I'm that I, that I think I'm most interested in right now is um, honestly it's GitHub, which might seem very uh, sort of basic and boring, and yet 
there's there's so much that happens there beyond the simple fact of checking in code and pulling code, mm -hmm. right? Like, in some ways, almost, almost like the, the cultural assumptions around GitHub, um, because I think, I think GitHub and Facebook share a similarity. Really? In that, hmm. in that face, Facebook is kind of the leading edge of the shockwave in terms of how humans interact socially online. And GitHub, I feel, has a, has a, is in a very similar place when it comes to developer communities, hmm. right? Because of the sort of the, the um, community standards that are, that are growing around various projects that are stored on GitHub. And you know, the way that GitHub is designed to manage things like forking and merge conflicts and issue filing and handling, right? Like the way that GitHub is designed is affecting how that stuff evolves basically is it affecting how those those those, those community um, mores develop um, and it's not that they're you know and it's not even that github has created their design to intentionally push those sorts of those sorts of conventions in certain ways but it's happening anyway in the same way that the way that facebook is designed is affecting mm -hmm. how People interact with each other on a, on a personal level, you know, and 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 you know, people will do things on Facebook, and suddenly everyone, like someone will do something uh, on Facebook, like you know, send a certain sort of message, and then everyone says, "Do I feel okay about that? Mm -hmm. Right? Is that like is it uh, as an example? Would it, is it is it is it appropriate to send a, a, a wedding thank you note?" Via Facebook <laughs> message, right? Okay, right. And but what would Emily Post have to say about this? Right? Well, okay, <laughs> right. Well, what would Emily Post? But not even what would Emily Post? What does everybody have to say about sure. it? What, what does everyone think about that? And some people are going to be like, "That's the I can't imagine why anyone would ever do something like that." And mm -hmm. then there are other people who would say, "Yeah, sure, why not?" But the way that the Facebook system is designed affects how those conventions are developing, and so. That's why I say I, I see GitHub and Facebook as being similar in that way, hmm. in that the the way that they're they're influencing culture, basically, um, you know, human sort of societal culture or developer societal culture, um, that the decisions they make have profound in, have profound uh, consequences moving forward, and again, I, that sort of loops back to what I was talking about before is one of the one of the biggest issues that were web issues that we're facing is that you know the decisions that we're making as designers um, actually have unpredictable and potentially very long lasting consequences in terms of how human interaction online develops and uh, that's what that's what makes it interesting and I don't I wish I had answers right I wish I could say and here's how you fix that I don't know um, but I do know that those those things are are going to develop one way or another, and you know, Twitter, for that matter, the way that it's designed, is totally influencing how we think about online harassment and how you deal with it, right? Yeah. Um, and what they do or do not do has profound consequences um, for you know five, ten years from now. What we you know what what we take for normal will be shaped by, not necessarily totally dictated by, but shaped by what Twitter and Facebook and GitHub do today. So. Right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I was glad to be here.